Welcome to the podcast entitled Electrolyte Solutions, Millimoles, Milli Equivalents, and Milli Osmoles. And from that kind of title, you can tell this is going to be three times as much fun as a regular podcast. But seriously, this is a very important topic. And it's one that I know historically from teaching pharmacy students that struggle, some students still struggle, especially with the concept of milliequivalents and the conversion from milligrams to millimoles to milliequivalents. And it's a skill that is fundamental in pharmacy practice. And primarily that's because many IV fluids used in pharmacy practice contain dissolved mineral salts called electrolytes. And they're called electrolytes because they conduct an electrical charge. Electrolytes such as sodium chloride ionize in water, meaning that they dissociate into their component ions and thereby expose their valence charge. For example, in water, sodium chloride, or NaCl, dissociates into the sodium ion, Na+, and the chloride ion, Cl-. The most important ions, whose concentrations are very closely regulated in body fluids, are the cations sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, and the anions chloride, carbonate, bicarbonate, and phosphate. Now, electrolytes in IV solutions and certain other oral drugs are interchangeably measured in the units of milligrams and millimoles and milliequivalents. Being able to correctly convert between these units of measure is particularly important when working in a hospital pharmacy with IV solutions. All right, let's begin with the question that reads, Ringer's injection contains 0.86% of sodium chloride, 0.03% of potassium chloride, and 0.033% of calcium chloride dihydrate. Calculate the sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride content in the units of milliequivalents per liter. So before we do the math, let's do a little bit of background. Is that way back in the 1800s, a physician named Sidney Ringer actually developed a solution that contains several electrolyte salts dissolved in water for the purpose of creating an isotonic solution. The solution was referred to as Ringer's after its inventor. Now, Ringer's solution typically contains sodium chloride, potassium chloride, calcium chloride, and even sometimes sodium bicarbonate used to balance the pH. Now, years later, a physician named Alexis Hartman determined that by adding lactate to the solution, it made it much more suitable for use in pediatric patients. Now, lactate is a chemical that is produced by our muscles during exercise and is a natural part of milk. With the addition of lactate, the solution became known as lactated ringers. Lactated ringers is typically used to replace fluid, blood, or both. But due to the sodium content, it is typically not used as an ongoing fluid replacement, but instead is frequently used when a large volume of fluid must be given initially, known as fluid resuscitation. So with that as a little bit of background, let's return to the question and, and rewrite some information, focusing on the three main electrolytes that we are adding to this solution, namely the first being sodium chloride, which has the formula of NaCl, and a formula weight of 58.5. Calcium, I'm sorry, potassium chloride with the formula KCl, which has a formula weight of 74.5. And then lastly, calcium chloride dihydrate. Now the formula for the calcium chloride is the CaCl2, and since it's the dihydrate, it's attached to two water molecules, which explains its formula weight being 147. So with those three electrolytes, let's calculate the amount of each of those in the units of milliequivalents per liter. So rewriting that information here, I'll show you my formulas. We're going to solve all of these simultaneously because they all work the same way for all three electrolytes. And what we need to do first is determine the number of molecules of each of our ingredients, the sodium chloride, potassium chloride, and calcium chloride dihydrate. Let's figure out how many molecules they are. So the, really the harder part is, well, well, where do we start? Well, remember the question wanted our units in milliequivalents per liter. So we're going to standardize the amount of each of our ingredients per liter. And so where would we start with is the fact that we're going to start with 1,000 milliliters, which is a liter. Okay? So again, these are going to be, I'm going to work all three of these at the same time because they're all solved in the same way. So for each ingredient, we start with 1,000 milliliters. We're then going to multiply by the concentration of each ingredient. 
Now these concentrations are different for each ingredient. The trick was, I'll remind you, that the question gave us the concentration of each ingredient in a percent weight per volume. So for example, for potassium chloride, the amount given was 0.86% weight per volume. So we have to convert that to meaning 0.86 grams per 100 milliliters. Similarly for the potassium chloride, the concentration of 0.03% is converted to meaning 0.03 grams per 100 milliliters. And lastly for calcium chloride, its concentration of 0.033% is the same as 0.033 grams per 100 mils. So hopefully you can see all we've done is express the concentration of each ingredient as a from percent weight per volume to the amount in grams per milliliter. That way when we multiply, you'll see that the units of milliliters will cancel, and we are now in the units of grams of each ingredient. The next step is simply to convert the units of grams to milligrams. So I multiply by the fact that there's a thousand milligrams on top for every one gram. Grams cancel, and now we're in the units of milligrams. This last step is probably the most important, and hopefully this is kind of a review of basic chemistry, but you need to understand what a unit of a mole is, or millimole. A mole is essentially the number of molecules, and the conversion is that one mole is equal to the formula weight of an ingredient in grams. So one mole is the formula weight in grams, so it stands to reason that one millimole would be the formula weight in milligrams, and that's the way I've chosen to express it here. So for example, for sodium chloride, we're going to multiply the weight in milligrams by the fact that in one millimole on top, there would be 58.5 milligrams. That's the formula weight for sodium chloride. Similarly for potassium chloride, there would be one mole over its formula weight of 74.5 milligrams. And lastly, down below for calcium chloride, you can see we're going to multiply by one mole over its formula weight of 147 milligrams. So we multiply that across, the milligram units cancel, and by doing this math on this slide, you can see that we have determined that for the sodium chloride, we, the, when we start with 1,000 milliliters, at that concentration, the 0.86% weight per volume, that would provide 147 millimoles in terms of the number of molecules of sodium chloride. It would also provide 4 millimoles of potassium chloride and 2.2 millimoles of the calcium chloride, given the concentrations that we're starting with. So going forward, I've rewritten those millimole amounts on top. Now we are going to determine the number of milliequivalents, and we'll do that one at a time for each electrolyte. We'll separate this out. So let's start by determining the milliequivalents contributed from the sodium chloride. So to do that, I have set up the equations for both, though there are reasons there are two lines here, is we need to do it separately from the sodium than we do from the chloride. We have to do them independently. So let's start with the sodium. I'll remind you from the previous slide, we determined that we have 147 millimoles of sodium chloride. And I'll remind you the formula for that is NaCl. The next step, though, is we want to know the milliequivalents of sodium, specifically just the sodium. So what we are going to multiply by the fact that every one molecule of sodium chloride has only one sodium. The formula is NaCl, so there's only one Na. So we can multiply by the proportion that there is one millimole of sodium for every one millimole of sodium chloride. There's one molecule of sodium for every molecule of sodium chloride. So now millimoles of sodium chloride cancel, and we just have millimoles of sodium. And then lastly, we convert from the millimoles, or the number of molecules of sodium, to their equivalent amount of electricity, or their charge, or their milliequivalents. All right? This is where the concept that you really have to grasp is what is the relationship between a millimole, which is a number of molecules, and the milliequivalent, which is the equivalent amount of electricity. I like to think of that capital E to remind me about electricity. Because the only the conversion, the way you go from the number of moles or millimoles to the number of milliequivalents is simply to multiply by the valence or the charge of that particular ion or cation. In this case, sodium is a plus one. So it has a one valence. So for every one molecule of sodium, you'll get a one electrical charge. It only exposes one charge. Therefore, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So that's why we can multiply by the fact that there is one milliequivalent of sodium for every one millimole. The valence number goes on top with the equivalence over the one millimole. 
And since the valence is 1, it's 1 to 1. So clearly just doing that math from left to right and canceling the units, you'll see that we have 147 milliequivalents of sodium. Okay, that's our answer for sodium. Now, let's do the same thing for chloride. Now remember, we're starting with that same 147 millimoles of sodium chloride, but now we can multiply it by the fact that, again, there is one chloride molecule for every one sodium chloride molecule. And likewise, since the valence on chloride is a minus 1, it exposes one electrical charge, we're going to multiply by the fact that there is one milliequivalent. The charge was 1, so on top is the 1 for the charge, milliequivalent, over 1 millimole. Therefore, we multiply across again, and we also get 147 milliequivalents of chloride. Right? That's our answer from sodium chloride. Let's move on now to potassium chloride. I'm going to go through these a little bit faster because they work the same. So again, we need to do them separately. There are two ions coming from potassium chloride, both the potassium and the chloride. So if we start with the potassium, remember we are starting with an amount of 4 millimoles. We multiply that by the fact that there is one molecule of potassium in every one molecule of potassium chloride. Then we multiply that by the fact that their valence on potassium is 1. Therefore, there is one charge or one milliequivalent for every one millimole. Multiply across and we get four milliequivalents of potassium. Doing the same thing for the chloride. We start with the four millimole molecules of potassium chloride and realize there's one chloride molecule for every one potassium chloride. Multiply that by the fact that chloride has a negative one charge, so one for the valence goes on top, one milliequivalent for every one millimole. We multiply that across, and once again, we get 4 milliequivalents of chloride. But I remind you, this 4 milliequivalents of chloride is coming from the potassium chloride. I remind you up above, we have already gotten some chloride also from the sodium chloride. So just realize we'll need to add up the chlorides as we continue through this question. Okay. Last electrolyte to deal with was our calcium chloride. So this one's a little bit different. It's got some interesting uh, ch you know, variations from the ones we've talked about. So let's just start with that. Starts exactly the same, that what we had from our previous slide is determined that we'll have 2.2 millimoles of calcium chloride in our solution. We're going to do the same step. Let's multiply it by the fact that there is for calcium, and again, here we are calculating the milliequivalents of calcium. So the relationship is there is one calcium molecule for every one calcium chloride molecule. Okay, given the formula CaCl2, there's one calcium for every one calcium chloride molecule. Okay. Now, however, when we convert the number of millimoles of calcium to the milliequivalents, I'll remind you that the valence on calcium is no longer one, it's actually two. Calcium has a positive two charge. Therefore, the valence is two. Therefore, there are two milliequivalents. Remember, the valence number, the electrical charge number two, goes with that capital E, E for electricity. So milliequivalents, there are two milliequivalents for every one millimole. One molecule of calcium provides two electrical charges. So there are two milliequivalents for every one millimole of calcium. Millimoles of calcium cancel, and we will have a final unit of milliequivalents. So by the time we take 2.2 times 1 divided by 1 times 2 divided by 1, we see that our answer would be 4.4 milliequivalents of calcium. All right. Now, let's do the same process for chloride here in those uh, interesting difference. We'll still start with the fact that we have 2.2 millimoles of calcium chloride. Multiply that by the fact, though, it's important here. Look at the formula. The formula for calcium chloride is CaCl2. Therefore, there are two millimoles or two chloride molecules for every one calcium chloride molecule. So we need to multiply this by the fact that there are two millimoles of chloride for every one millimole of calcium chloride. And that comes from the formula. Again, the fact that it's CaCl2 meaning two chloride molecules, which means there are two millimoles of chloride for every one millimole of calcium chloride. But now that we're in millimoles of chloride, all we do is multiply by the fact that the, again, chloride has a valence of negative one, so there's one milliequivalent for every one millimole for chloride. Therefore, we get 4.4 milliequivalents of chloride. So our last step is to summarize all of this information. I've rewritten the, the math that we just did on the previous slide. So to summarize, what we have, first off, is sodium. 
Okay, and the sodium we calculated was 147. So I'm going to bring that down from what we did previously. There's a reason for all this kind of cool animation you'll see here, I hope. Anyways, for potassium, what we calculated was that it had four milliequivalents. Okay, now that was, I'll remind you, per liter. This whole question started with these amounts per liter. So I'm just re-expressing the amounts we just calculated and the, reminding you that that is the amount actually per liter. And then calcium, we calculated to be the 4.4 milliequivalents per liter. And lastly, and the only thing that's a little bit trick, is to remember it in terms of calculating the total concentration in milliequivalents per liter for chloride, it doesn't matter where it comes from. We're going to add all of the chloride together. So I'll just remind you, we had 147 milliequivalents of chloride from the sodium chloride. We had four milliequivalents from the potassium chloride, and we had 4.4 milliequivalents from the calcium chloride. All of those electrolytes contain chloride. So in the end, we have to add the 147 to the 4 to the 4.4 to see that our total for the calcium, I'm sorry, total for the chloride is going to be 155.4. And so those are all the values we've calculated expressed per liter. And one thing I thought was interesting, given the label I showed you before, let's compare that to the labeled version of the Ringer's irrigation, and we can see with some only slight differences with rounding, our values are correct. It matches what was labeled for that product. So I think we have completed this question successfully. Okay, our next question is a great example of being able to convert between units. In this example, going from milliequivalents to millimoles to milligrams and then to milliliters. So being able to set that up and cancel units, this is a great example of that. So let's read the question. An intravenous solution calls for the addition of 25 milliequivalents of sodium bicarbonate. How many milliliters of an 8.4% weight per volume sodium bicarbonate injection should be added to the formula. Okay, A little bit of background on sodium bicarbonate. You can see the uh, vial there. It's a commonly used IV agent, and sodium bicarbonate is used as a systemic alkalinizing agent. It is most often used, administered IV, in the treatment of metabolic or respiratory acidosis. Sodium bicarbonate is sometimes also used for urinary alkalization. Now, despite being an effective antacid, it's typically not used for that purpose or rarely used for the chronic treatment of something like peptic ulcer disease because the drug itself can actually be absorbed and can affect the systemic acid-base balance. You know, and lastly, sodium bicarbonate has been around a long time. It was actually approved in 1938 by the FDA at its very inception, at the very start of the FDA. So we've certainly used it for a long time as an alkalinizing agent. So with that in mind... What, let's rewrite the information from the question, and the information we need to know to answer this question is that we're trying to administer sodium bicarbonate, so we need to know its formula. Its formula is Na for sodium, HCO3. So NaHCO3, it has a formula weight of 84, and the injectable we're using here, you can see on the vial, has a concentration of 8.4% weight per volume, and the amount prescribed was 25 milliequivalents. So with all of that information, let's go ahead and answer this question. So I'll show you my formulas here on the bottom, but let's work through them one step at a time. And it starts with what was prescribed. And what was prescribed was 25 milliequivalents of sodium bicarbonate. Milliequivalents, though, refers to electrical charge, which is produced by ions. So remember, sodium bicarbonate in solution is going to separate into ions. So if we have 25 milliequivalents of sodium bicarbonate, that means we have 25 milliequivalents of sodium and 25 milliequivalents of bicarbonate ions. So let's start with the fact, and just to kind of simplify to visualize this, we're going to start with the fact that what we want is 25 milliequivalents of sodium, because that's how much will be in 25 milliequivalents of sodium bicarbonate. So starting with 25 milliequivalents of sodium, our first step would be to convert that to the number of molecules. And remember, the conversion is the valence of the sodium molecule goes with the milliequivalents. And since the valence of sodium is a plus 1, then for every 1 milliequivalent, we have 1 millimole. 1 molecule of sodium produces 1 milliequivalent of sodium because of the valence of 1. Those units will cancel, and we will now be in the number of molecules of sodium. The next step is to convert from sodium molecules to the molecules of sodium bicarbonate. 
And if we look at the formula for sodium bicarbonate, it is NaHCO3. There is one sodium ion for every one molecule of sodium bicarbonate based off the formula. So we can set it up like this, one millimole of sodium bicarbonate over one millimole of sodium. One sodium for every one sodium bicarbonate. So now we're in the number of molecules, millimoles, of sodium bicarbonate. Now, this is the conversion. We want to convert now from millimoles to milligrams. And to do that, we multiply by the fact that we know that one millimole of a, of a chemical is equivalent to its formula weight in milligrams. So the formula weight for sodium bicarbonate was 84. So we'll multiply by the fact that there are 84 milligrams of sodium bicarbonate for every one millimole of sodium bicarbonate. Millimoles cancel, and now we've converted from milliequivalents to millimoles, and now finally into milligrams. So our 25 milliequivalents of sodium is equivalent to essentially 2100 milligrams of sodium bicarbonate. Now, to finish this question up, we simply need to start with that 2100 milligrams of sodium bicarbonate and convert that to the volume of the injectable that we need to provide that amount. So we'll start with our 2100 milligrams, but we'll first need to convert milligrams to grams. So I'll multiply my 2100 milligrams by the fact that in every one gram, there is a thousand milligrams. So now milligrams will cancel and I'm in grams. And I did that because we were told that the concentration of our injectable was an 8.4% weight per volume. That by definition means 8.4 grams per 100 milliliters. So what I want to multiply is set it up so that my units cancel. So on top I want my 100 milliliters and below that I'm going to put my 8.4 grams. And since we've converted our value into grams, grams will cancel and our final answer will be in milliliters. So if I take 2100 milligrams Divide it by 1,000 milligrams to convert to grams. Multiply by 100 and divide by 8.4. You'll see mathematically you end up with 25 in the final remaining units as milliliters. So to summarize, tw if I, let's summarize this going backwards because what we've just calculated is the fact that if I take 25 milliliters out of this injectable vial, and this vial has an 8.4% weight per volume, that volume, 25 mils, would provide 2,100 milligrams of sodium bicarbonate. If we convert sodium bicarbonate milligrams to millimoles and then go from millimoles to milliequivalents, that would provide 25 milliequivalents. So that's kind of how you can uh, convert. And what we've done in this question is convert from milliequivalents to millimoles first, millimoles to milligrams, and then from milligrams through grams to milliliters. So hopefully you were able to follow that. And I'll still say setting these formulas up such that your units cancel one step at a time is the most effective way to correctly solve these questions. Okay, this next question is very similar, but actually goes backwards. So you're going to see we're going to start with a volume and end up in mel equivalents. So the question reads, calcium gluconate injection, 10%, is available in a 10 milliliter ampule. How many milliequivalents of calcium does the ampule contain? So a little bit of background before we jump into the math is that calcium gluconate is the calcium salt of gluconic acid. Now clearly calcium is essential for many body processes including the nervous, muscular, and skeletal system. What you might not have been aware of is that calcium is actually very important for things like blood coagulation and the electrical conduction within the heart. Now, IV or parenteral calcium is needed in situations where there is an acute cardiac arrest or even a life-threatening cardiac arrhythmia. However, keep in mind there are actually two forms of calcium salts available for IV. There's the calcium gluconate we've been discussing, but it only prevents nine, it provides 9% 9 elemental calcium, whereas the other product called calcium chloride provides 27% elemental calcium. So in clear acute crisis situations such as post-cardiac arrest or for these arrhythmias, the calcium chloride would be the preferred salt to be used. However, in non-acute or non-arrest settings where we just need mild to moderate replacement of calcium, such as in total parenteral nutrition or so forth, then it's actually the calcium gluconate that is preferred because it has a lower potential for infusion site reactions compared to calcium chloride. So it is a situation where you will see both forms used IV in hospital settings. And this question is clearly about the calcium gluconate. So let's rewrite some of the information from the question. 
First of all, I give you the formula listed there for calcium gluconate. What I would point out to you is that realize that in one molecule of calcium gluconate there is only one calcium ion. So one calcium ion actually then binds to two gluconate ions. So if you can kind of see that there in the formula. Also given is the formula weight of 430. And I'll remind you the question describes our product as having 10%, so that's a 10% weight per volume concentration of calcium gluconate in an ampule that contains a total volume of 10 milliliters. So with all that information, we can now solve this question. So I'll show you my formulas here, and then we'll work through this one step at a time. And this question really starts with the fact that we want to know how much calcium is available in our ampule. And our ampule has a total volume of 10 milliliters. So let's start with our 10 milliliters of volume, and then multiply that by the fact that the concentration given to us was 10%. So we need to rewrite that though as 10 grams of calcium gluconate per or over 100 milliliters. Therefore milliliters will cancel when we multiply and we will be in the units of grams of calcium gluconate. The next step I have is to simply convert from grams of calcium gluconate to milligrams. And we do that by multiplying by the fact that there's a thousand milligrams over one gram. Units of grams will cancel, and our final answer will be in milligrams. So if you do that math all the way across, you can see that our 10 milliliters actually contains 1,000 milligrams of calcium gluconate. Okay. So going forward with that same fact, our next step actually is to take the 1,000 milligrams, the weight of our calcium gluconate, and convert it into the number of molecules of calcium gluconate. And we do that again by reminding you by the fact that one millimole of a molecule is equal to its formula weight in milligrams. So in this case, we're going to multiply by the fact that in one millimole of calcium gluconate, there would be 430 milligrams of calcium gluconate because 430 is its formula weight. And if we multiply across, we can see that the units of milligrams cancel and we will be in the units of millimoles of the parent molecule, calcium gluconate. Okay. But the question wanted to know how many milliequivalents of calcium. So our next step is to actually convert from the number of molecules of calcium gluconate to simply the number of molecules of the calcium ion. And to do that, we have to go back to the formula. And as I pointed out earlier, the formula has one calcium ion and two gluconate ions. So there's, I set up the proportion on top as saying that there is one millimole of calcium ions for every one millimole of calcium gluconate because the parent molecule calcium gluconate only contains one calcium ion. So now when we multiply across, our units of millimoles of calcium gluconate cancel, and we are now in millimoles, or the number of molecules of just the calcium ion. So our last step then is to convert from the number of molecules of calcium to the number of milliequivalents of calcium. And remember, milliequivalents with a capital E really stands for electricity, and that really stands for valence. So we have to look at the calcium ion and remind ourselves that a calcium ion has a valence of a positive 2. It has two electrical charges for every one molecule. So we set up the proportion on top as 2, since the valence is 2, 2 milliequivalents of calcium over for every 1 millimole of calcium ion. That way millimoles cancel, and our final answer would be, doing the math all the way across, would be 4.65 milliequivalents of calcium. So just as a reminder, that's the end of our question, what we have solved. And what we can say now is that a 10 milliliter ampule of a 10% weight per volume concentration of calcium gluconate will provide 4.65 milliequivalents of calcium ion. All right, I really like this next question because it kind of reps, represents a clinical application of this sort of mathematical conversion. So the question reads, a patient has a sodium deficit of 168 milliequivalents. How many milliliters of an isotonic sodium chloride solution, defined as having 0.9% weight per volume concentration, how much of that should be administered to replace this deficit? So a little bit of background before we jump into the math is that this situation of having a sodium deficit is essentially termed hyponatremia or low sodium. And hyponatremia is defined as occurring when a patient's serum sodium concentration falls below a concentration of 136 milliequivalents per liter. 
Now, this reduction is caused by a relative excess of water relative to the amount of sodium in the blood. Now, common causes of this could do, be due to dehydration, and that dehydration could be caused by diuretics, which, in, which promotes sodium loss or excretion in the kidney, or it could be caused by extreme or prolonged diarrhea or vomiting. Also, certain chronic heart, liver, or kidney diseases can also lead to this imbalance and causing hyponatremia. Now, the clinical signs and symptoms of uh, low uh, serum sodium are primarily exhibited by the nervous system, which is kind of interesting. And that's because with a relatively lower amount of sodium in the blood, less oncotic pressure, therefore, then the water is more freely able to passively diffuse into, into, blood, into tissues. And this occurs more likely in the brain cells, in the central nervous system. And with this increased swelling because of the water moving into the brain swells, very small changes can cause symptoms including headache, confusion, stupor, and in severe cases, even seizure or coma could occur. Now, treatment of this situation is not overly confusing. It involves, first of all, restricting water intake and promoting water loss through diuretics to try to reduce the water part and at the same time actually then replace the sodium deficit, And as we're going to do in this uh, question, and ultimately, therefore, also figure out what caused the underlying disorder in the first place. So in this question, going back to the rewritten information, what we're trying to do in this treatment of hyponatremia is replace and increase the amount of sodium to uh, fix this imbalance between the water and the sodium. So what we know in the question is that the actual sodium deficit in this patient is 168 milliequivalents. So to fix that deficit, we're going to infuse sodium chloride solution. So again, a reminder, the formula for sodium chloride is NaCl, one sodium with one chloride. The formula weight of that molecule is 58.5, and the concentration of the solution we are using to replace it is called normal saline, which was defined as 0.9% a weight per volume concentration. So with that, let's solve this question. So I'll show you my formulas here, and we'll walk through them one step at a time. Interestingly, we, in this question, where we're starting with is the fact that we know the amount of sodium, the amount being the number of milli equivalents of sodium that we need to replace is 168. So we start with 168 milli equivalents of sodium. Our next step is to convert the milli equivalents of sodium back to the number of molecules of sodium. So we use this proportion. And to remember to be able to relate the number of molecules to the number of milli equivalents, of sodium, we have to look at the valence. And since the charge or valence of sodium is a positive one, we can set up the ratio that one millimole of sodium has one milli equivalent because the valence of sodium is one on the bottom with the milli equivalents, we have a one to one relationship. So when we multiply this, we will cancel our units of milli equivalents and we will now be in millimoles or the number of molecules of sodium. Our next step, though, is to go from the number of molecules of just the sodium ion to the number of molecules of the sodium chloride molecule. And so we use the formula for that. And the formula for sodium chloride is NaCl, so one sodium for every one chloride. So we can set up the proportion by multiplying on top that in one millimole of sodium chloride, there is on the bottom one millimole of sodium. Millimoles of sodium cancel, and we will be in millimoles now of the parent molecule, sodium chloride. So if we do that math straight across, you can see that 168 milli equivalents of sodium is equivalent to 168 millimoles of sodium chloride. Now from that, we're going to start with that same number, 168 millimoles of sodium chloride, and now convert that to the weight of sodium chloride by multiplying by the fact that the formula weight of 58.5 milligrams of sodium chloride is equivalent to 1 millimole. So millimoles will cancel, and we will be in the units now of milligrams. Okay. Now we're going to want to convert from milligrams. My next step is to convert from those milligrams to grams by multiplying by the fact that there is one gram for every 1,000 milligrams. So now I've converted my milligrams of sodium chloride to grams of sodium chloride. And the reason I did that is that my last step, remember, is to convert to the volume of the solution that we need to infuse to provide that weight of sodium chloride. So what we were told was that normal saline, or the solution we're using, is a 0.9% weight per volume. So I set this up as setting that equivalent to, for every 100 milliliters on top, 
set that over, there would be 0.9 grams because that's a 0.9% solution. I set it up this way so that my units of grams will cancel and my final answer will be in milliliters. So if you do all of that math, starting from 168 millimoles of sodium chloride and going straight across, the math would end up with 1,092 milliliters. And the final units remaining there are milliliters. So just to summarize, we figured out that if we infuse 1,092 milliliters of a 0.9% weight per volume solution of sodium chloride, that would ultimately provide our 168 mL equivalents of sodium, which would therefore uh, correct this patient's sodium imbalance. This last question is going to kind of be, uh, is different, in the sense that up to now we have been calculating or converting from the weight in milligrams to the number of molecules in millimoles to the number of equivalent electrical charges, which is milliequivalents. This last question is not about milliequivalents. So now we're no longer cared about the electrical charge produced by our number of molecules. Instead, we want to know the osmotic pressure or the osmotic force caused by the number of particles, meaning the number of moles of our, each one of our particles in the blood. Okay, So just as a little bit of background before we even read the question, just remember that osmotic pressure is influenced by the concentration of solutes in the solution. It is directly proportional to the number of molecules and not dependent on the size of those molecules. And because electrolytes dissociate into their component ions, they in essence, in essence add more solute particles into the solution and have a greater effect on osmotic pressure per mass than compounds that don't dissociate in water such as glucose. So one other thing and then I'll kind of describe the pictures on here some terminology is that we'll be talking about osmolarity, but you also may hear osmolality. So plasma osmolarity measures the body's electrolyte and water balance. But osmolality represents or is the units of milliosmoles per kilogram of water. Well, that essentially kilogram of water is the same as one liter of water. So the terms that are functionally the same, even though they're technically different, is the terms osmolality and osmolarity. We will use them somewhat interchangeably in biology because both of them essentially measure the osmoles or milliosmoles per liter of, of fluid. And for blood, there is a normal range. And that's the whole point of this question is that we should only be infusing or administering fluids that are compatible with our biologic fluids such as blood. And a normal reference range, as you can kind of see in this picture on the right, for blood is rounding a little bit, is 280 to 300 milliosmoles per liter or per kilogram. So we'll just say that the, uh, the osmolarity of the solution is between 280 and 300 milliosmoles per liter. And that's a normal reference range for blood. Why is this important? Is that, and I use the example of two commercial products, both made by Braun in terms of their label here, that are used IVs in the preparation of IVs for clinical use. The one on the bottom is the 5% dextrose injection, and that is an isotonic solution that's very used, often used, where we put drugs and other medicines into IV solutions, we'll use 5% dextrose. Because, as you can see, and I've expanded it out there a little bit, you can see where it says the calculated osmolarity of that solution is 250 osmoles per liter. So just slightly uh, hypotonic in terms of the solution. And we do that because oftentimes we'll add drugs to that solution, which will increase the osmolarity closer to the normal reference range. So that's why it works well as a normal solution, as an isotonic solution. Don't get that confused with, like, for example, the label above that is got a 5 and it's got dextrose, but it's actually 50% dextrose. You'll notice with the 50% dextrose, it very clearly has a big red warning that says, not for direct infusion, must be diluted. Why is that? Why do you need a big red warning? Well, expand out and look at where it says that the calculated osmolarity for that solution is 2,525 milliosmoles per liter. That's almost 10, that's essentially a tenfold increase in the osmotic pressure because it is such a highly concentrated solution of dextrose. This solution of dextrose is not intended for basic infusion. Instead, it's used when high doses of, of dextrose need to be added for some sort of hypoglycemia or some other sort of medical indication where we need to use dextrose as kind of our therapeutic agent. It would still need to be further diluted in our solution. 
So just trying to emphasize that taking into account the number or the solute, the number of particles in the solution is extremely important. And it's one of the things we have to make sure that our IV fluids stay within a compatible range. So having said that, let's look at what the actual question is. It says, what would the osmolarity of 1000 milliliters of a solution be containing 10% weight per volume dextrose, 0.225% weight per volume of sodium chloride, and 15 milliequivalents of calcium gluconate. So what would the, when you add all of that stuff together, what would the overall on osmotic force be in essentially osmolarity, which is the milliosmoles per liter, be of this solution? So let's rewrite the important information to answer this question, is that we are talking about preparing a solution with a total volume of 1,000 milliliters. Now what's not given in the question that we have to understand is that the effect on, os on osmotic pressure is different between non-electrolytes and electrolytes. So in this question, the non-electrolyte we have is dextrose, and we have it in a concentration of 10%. On the other hand, our other two additives are electrolyte solutions. The two that we have are sodium chloride at a concentration of 0.225% and calcium gluconate at 15 milliequivalents. So we'll have to deal with the non-electrolytes, you'll see, will be different than the contribution produced by the electrolytes. And just make sure you understand why that is. Because a molecule like dextrose, one molecule, when we put it into water, it doesn't dissociate. It's still just one molecule. So it will only produce essentially the osmotic force of one solute. On the other hand, and again, dextrose is a relatively large molecule with a relatively heavy formula weight, especially compared to sodium chloride, which is a teeny tiny molecule with a very low molecular weight. But sodium chloride, when you put one molecule of that into solution, it dissociates into two ions. So you get one sodium ion and one chloride ion. And even though they're small, they both produce a separate osmotic force. So essentially you get two osmotic forces from one molecule of sodium chloride compared to just one osmotic force from one dextrose molecule because it doesn't dissociate. But because of that, you'll see as we go and answer this question, clearly contribution will be different between electrolytes, which have twice as much, or, or more even, I should say, versus non-electrolytes, which don't dissociate. So with that, let's go ahead and answer this question. We'll begin by, in this case, I'll choose to, let's look at the non-electrolytes, which in this case is dextrose. So looking just at the dextrose, where we would start at is the fact that we are producing one th or preparing 1,000 milliliters of this solution. So let's start with 1,000 milliliters. Next, we'll multiply that by its concentration, which was given to us as 10% weight per volume, which means 10 grams for every 100 milliliters. We multiply that across, we'll cancel our milliliters units, and we will be in units of grams. Next, we want to convert from the weight in grams to the number of molecules. So we simply use the fact that one mole of a substance is equivalent to its formula weight in grams. So we'll put one mole of dextrose on top over its formula weight of 180 grams on the bottom. Grams will cancel and we will be in moles. Next, let's just simply convert moles to millimoles by multiplying by the fact that there's a thousand millimoles for every one mole. So moles cancel and we're now in the units of millimoles. Great. Number of molecules. We're in millimoles. Our last step is to convert from the number of molecules to the amount of osmotic force produced by those molecules. And this is where it's important to understand, because dextrose is not an electrolyte, because it does not dissociate, one molecule of dextrose will only produce one milliosmole of force. It doesn't dissociate. So that's why the relationship here is one to one. So I put one milliosmole on top per every one millimole or number of molecules on the bottom. Millimoles will cancel and our final units will be in milliosmoles. So doing that math all the way across, you can see that a thousand milliliters of a 10% weight per volume solution of dextrose would produce 555.6 milliosmoles of osmotic force. Next, let's move on to our first electrolyte, which was sodium chloride. And remind you, the formula for that is NaCl, but since it is an electrolyte, when we put that into water, it will dissociate into one sodium molecule and one chloride ion. 
All right, we're going to start in the same place. We're preparing 1,000 milliliters of this solution. So we'll take that, we'll multiply it by its concentration, which was given to us as 0.225% weight per volume, which is the same as 0.225 grams per 100 mils. Mills will cancel, we'll be in grams. Again, we will now convert from the weight of sodium chloride to the number of molecules of sodium chloride by multiplying by the fact that in one mole, there's over the formula weight, which is 58.5 grams. Grams cancel, and we're in moles. We'll convert moles to millimoles by multiplying by 1,000. And now we can convert from millimoles to the amount of osmotic force produced by those molecules. So this is where, again, you look at the formula, and we say if we had one millimole or one molecule of sodium chloride, because it dissociates into two things, a sodium and a chloride, those are two things, there would be two milliosmoles for every one molecule. So that's why we're multiplying by two milliosmoles milliosmoles on top over one millimole of sodium chloride. Therefore, our final answer, if we do that math all the way across, is would result in a final, cons or final pressure of 76.9 milliosmoles. All right, our last additive is the calcium gluconate. And if we look at the formula, this is where it's a little bit tricky. I just want to point out that calcium gluconate has one calcium ion, it will dissociate, it is an electrolyte, and when it dissociates, it dissociates actually into three things. Because calcium has a positive two charge, a gluconate molecule itself only has a negative one charge. So the formula is one calcium with two gluconates. Because of that, when they all dissociate in water, you get three particles. One calcium, one gluconate, and another gluconate. So there are three things total. So keep that in mind as we go to answer this question. But let's start at the beginning. And what we were told in this question is that we would start with 15 milliequivalents of the calcium ion. So let's take those milliequivalents and first convert that back into the number of molecules that produce those. So we would need to look at the calcium ion and see what its valence is. The charge on calcium is two. And remember the valence goes with the E for electricity. So there would be two, the valence of two milliequivalents for every one millimole of calcium. So I set it up where I multiplied so that we cancel milliequivalents. So I have one millimole of calcium on top over two milliequivalents of calcium. Milliequivalents of calcium will cancel. We will now be in the number of millimoles or molecules of just the calcium ion. Our next step is to convert from the calcium ion itself back to just the number of molecules of calcium gluconate. Well, we have to look at the formula. The formula for calcium gluconate has one calcium for every one calcium gluconate molecule. So I can multiply by the fact that there's one millimole of calcium gluconate, the parent molecule, over one millimole of calcium because there's only one calcium in a calcium gluconate molecule. So now units of millimoles of calcium cancel and we're in millimoles of calcium gluconate. So now we can convert from the number of molecules of calcium gluconate to the amount of osmotic pressure produced by that when it's put into solution and it dissociates. And I'll remind you, I've already said that calcium gluconate will dissociate into three particles, a calcium and two gluconates. So three things that are produced when it dissociates means that we'll multiply times three milliosmoles on top for every one millimole of the parent molecule, calcium gluconate. And when we multiply all of that math all the way across, you should get a value of 22.5 milliosmoles from the calcium gluconate. We're almost done. The last step is essentially to add all of that oncotic pressure together because it doesn't matter what's producing the osmotic force. It's the overall force would be the additive effects of all of them. So our total answer is the 555.6 milliosmoles from the dextrose is added to the 76.9 milliosmoles from the sodium chloride added to the 22.5 milliosmoles from the calcium gluconate, and our total osmotic force of this solution with all of those ingredients would be 655 milliosmoles. So hopefully you found this podcast helpful. I will just reemphasize that it is extremely important to be able to understand the concepts and be able to convert units from weight in things like milligrams to the number of molecules, which is millimoles. And from millimoles, as you can see in this podcast, you've got to be able to then associate that with the number of either electrical charges, meaning milliequivalents, or the number of particles in solute to be able to uh, calculate the milliosmoles or the osmotic force. So hopefully this was helpful.